Good evening. You're watching the news tonight, your daily roundup of all that has happened across India and the world. I'm Ashan Russell, and tonight we'll be focusing on uh, FIFA elections. Yes, after being mired in a lot of controversy, a corruption scandal that just suddenly erupted, uh, the world uh, foot, football's world body will be going to the polls later today. And uh, what does all that mean for FIFA, for uh, world football? Uh, we'll be talking about that with a special guest as well a little later in the show. But first, the headlines we're tracking right now. India outshines China in GDP growth of 7.5% since the start of the year. GDP grew by 7.3% in the last financial year. The Supreme Court seeks Kejriwal government's reply on the center's plea challenging a high court order. Meanwhile, the Delhi High Court passes interim order allowing LG to take calls on key appointments. Toll from the severe heat wave crosses 1800 with most casualties in Andhra Pradesh and Telangana. The Met Office says the respite is just two days away. Radioactive scare in Delhi leads detected in a medical consignment from Turkey at the IGI airport in Delhi. And a corruption scandal notwithstanding, FIFA is all set to elect its next president despite opposition from the US and UEFA, their latter favourites for another term. The top story this evening, India's economic growth has zipped to 7.5% for January through March, the fourth quarter of last fiscal. Now this figure puts India's economic growth ahead of China, which grew at 7% in the March quarter. For the last fiscal year, economic growth rate in India came in at 7.3% compared to 6.9% in its previous year. Much of the growth came from the manufacturing and services sectors. The acceleration follows a revision in the base for calculating national accounts from 2011-12 to from 2004-05. This is in spite of a decline in agriculture growth from 3.7% 3 to 0.2%. The encouraging part of the data is the growth in manufacturing to 7.1% from last year's 5.3%, which would actually mean that we are also creating jobs in our growth path. It's absolutely clear that the economy is in a recovery mode. I say that because uh, the services sector has significantly improved, it's doing well. What seems to be a silver lining is that the manufacturing sector is now growing. Now, the Delhi High Court today passed an interim order directing Lieutenant Governor Najib Jung to consider proposals sent by the Kejriwal government. The court said that if the Lieutenant Governor is not satisfied with the proposals, he can send it back to the Council of Ministers. The court has also asked the Ahmadni Party government to file an affidavit on how the previous Delhi governments took decisions regarding appointments and transfers of top bureaucrats. And amid the ongoing power tussle in Delhi, Home Minister Rajnath Singh said the central government has no intentions to run the national capital through the Lieutenant Governor. The Supreme Court has sought the Delhi government's response on the centre's plea today, seeking stay on the High Court ruling, which termed the MHA notification on the LG's bars as suspect. The Supreme Court has refused to stay a Delhi High Court order allowing Anti-Corruption Bureau of Delhi to take action against officials in corruption cases on Friday. However, the court clarified that observation made by the High Court on MHA notification of 21st of May was tentative in nature and it would not be binding. The court saw Delhi government's response in three weeks on the plea seeking stay on the High Court ruling which termed the notification as suspect. All the unwarranted observations which were there in Para 66 have been stayed by the Supreme Court of India and uh, the, uh, the, uh, the Delhi government has been given three weeks time to respond to this uh, SLP and thereafter the matters will be listed. The High Court verdict said the centre has wrongly stated that the Lieutenant Governor is not obliged to consult Delhi Chief Minister Arvind Kejriwal about the appointments of bureaucrats. In the High Court, the Ahmadmi Party government wants the entire notification dismissed as unconstitutional. उन्होंने कहा कि दिल्ली हाई कोर्ट इस पूरे मसले पर नए सिरे से सुनवाई करे और ये कहा है कि जो ऑब्जर्वेशन था उस ऑब्जर्वेशन से इन्फ्लुएंस आने की जरूरत नहीं है आप उसके बिना भी आप काम कर सकते 
Meanwhile, the center has clarified that it has no intention to rule the national capital through a back door, as alleged by the Amani Party government. Home Minister Rajnath Singh ruled out any chances of Delhi getting full statehood soon. कौन क्या करता है ये उसके ऊपर निर्भर करता है उसके संबंध में मैं कोई कमेंट नहीं देना चाहूंगा अपना लेकिन लायन आर्डर की प्रॉब्लम मेरी खड़ी होगी तो मैं समझता हूं कि उसको कंट्रोल करना ये जिम्मेदारी है ही हम लोगों की The Delhi High Court has also decided to hear the plea against the center's notification on 5th of August after the Delhi government files its reply on the Supreme Court notice Bureau report Rajya Sabha TV Moving on now, in the backdrop of anti-national activities by separatists in Jammu and Kashmir, Home Minister Rajnath Singh today came out with a stern warning. He said anyone found waving the Pakistani flag in India would not be spared. However, this warning seems to have had little effect. Take a look at this report. Home Minister Rajnath Singh's warning to people involved in waving Pakistani flags in any part of India, including Jammu and Kashmir. Saying there could be no compromise against such activities, Rajnath Singh also warned of strict action against perpetrators. We can compromise everything, but if we have a Pakistan flag, we can't compromise in any situation. Even as the minister warned of strict action, separatist leader Shabir Shah and his supporters waved Pakistani flags in Anandpur on Friday. No, certainly this is outrageous, this is worrisome, and we expect the state government to take strict action. And having said that, let me also add over here that the kind of competitive upmanship which is being witnessed to appease the separatists in Kashmir Valley certainly doesn't augur well for a democracy. In his press conference on Modi government's completion of a year in power, the Home Minister also said Interpol had issued red corner notices against Daud Ibrahim and many others. He said the process to get hold of anti-India elements living abroad was underway. Bureau report, Rajya Sabha TV. The first meeting of the Joint Committee of Parliament examining the proposed land acquisition bill was held today. The meeting was headed by BJP's SSR Luwalia, who leads the 30-member panel. It includes 20 members from the Lok Sabha and 10 members from the Rajya Sabha. The panel has to submit its report on the first day of the monsoon session. Despite sailing through the Lok Sabha, the bill got stuck in the upper house where the government is in a minority. After sustained pressure from the opposition and allies to water down the bill, the government agreed to refer it to the committee. And for all the other national stories, let's take you nationwide. Tamil Nadu Chief Minister J. J. Lalata will contest the June 27th by-election from the Radha Krishnan Nagar Assembly constituency. The seat was vacated by a party MLA P. Vettrivel soon after she was acquitted in the disproportionate act of case. J. Lalata was earlier elected from a native Sri Rangam constituency. J. Lalata needs to be elected as an MLA within six months of taking charge as the Chief Minister. Pradeep Kumar Sinha has been appointed as the new cabinet secretary. He will replace Ajit Seth, who will complete his term next month. Sinha is currently power secretary. He has been holding this post since July 2013. He had earlier been secretary in the Ministry of Shipping and has held several other important positions in the union government and in the youth of itself. The National Human Rights Commission has recommended an inquiry by the CBI into the Chittur encounter in which 20 suspected sandalwood smugglers were killed. The Commission has also recommended rupees 5 lakhs as compensation as interim relief for the families of those killed. The Commission had on 7th April issued a notice to the Andhra Pradesh government seeking a report over the killing and observed that the incident involved a serious violation of human rights of individuals. A group of unidentified gunmen opened fire at police personnel deployed outside a bank in Jammu and Kashmir's Shopia district today. The attack left one policeman critically injured. The army has cordoned off the entire area and launched a massive search operation to nab the attackers. Now on to a scare that happened in Delhi today. Aviation regulator DGCA is inquiring into the radioactive leak from a medical consignment at the cargo complex of the Indira Gandhi International Airport. The incident happened at a busy time for the airport at 8.30 in the morning, but luckily the leak was spotted in time and contained. 8.30 a.m. A regular Friday morning at the Indira Gandhi International Airport in Delhi turned chaotic. The reason? A radioactive leak. 
The leak was detected in a medical consignment from Istanbul that was meant for a private hospital in the city. Radioactive packet है, वो leakage है, और उसके लिए इन्होंने जो जरूरी कदम दा, उसको देखते हैं, उसको छुटवा दिया, वो area खाली करा दिया, कोई packet फट गया है, dangerous goods, तो इसकी वजह से सबको बाहर कर दिया गया। कोई उसमें कोई कोई हादसा नहीं हुआ। the National Disaster Response Force and anti-sabotage teams rushed to the spot to control the leak. Two workers who handled the consignment were rushed to the nearest hospital. After a few hours of panic and chaos, government health officials announced that the leak had been contained and that there was no need to worry. Latest information we have received that the NDRF team and the Atomic Commission people also have reached and the contaminated leak has been stopped. It has been contained and uh, uh, nothing to worry about. Delhi International Airport Limited said in a statement that there was no risk of exposure to any individual in the airport premises. Meanwhile, IGR Airport continued to operate smoothly. Bureau Report, Rajya Sabha TV. Now, the death toll due to the sweltering heat has climbed to 1,875 today. Most of the casualties were reported from Andhra Pradesh and Telangana, the worst in states. The Met Office says severe heat wave conditions would continue for at least two more days. Severe heat wave across the country has killed over 1,800 people so far, most of them from the states of Andhra Pradesh and Telangana. According to the Met Office, the heat wave would continue for another two days at least. There has not been even a break, uh, break of records of maximum temperature at any of the places in the country. But the continuity of the heat wave, persistence of the heat wave for about a week with uh, almost on daily basis uh, 45, 46, 46, uh, 47 degree centigrade temperature without a break uh, uh, may, may, may be one of the factors uh, which has affected human health. Most of the deaths reported have been due to dehydration and heat stroke. The severe heat coupled with frequent power failures has affected life across the country. The death toll so far this year due to heat wave is already higher than last year. However, monsoon rains are expected next week. Some of the northern states may also get some respite with thunderstorms predicted around the weekend. Bureau report, Rajya Sabha TV. Time for a quick break right now. Coming up on the other side, all the sports news, world number one shuttler, Saina Neval flashes out of the Australian Open Super Series. More on that on the other side. Action on defense, a major focus of the Modi government. Activity on the borders. Big ticket purchases. Moves to strengthen the forces. How has this sector fared these last 12 months? And where is it heading? Watch the big picture at 9.30 p.m. on Rajasabha Television. Welcome back. You're watching the news tonight. Now, FIFA members are set to vote for a new president in Zurich today as the football's world governing body battles a major corruption scandal. Seeking a fifth term, the present FIFA president, Seb Blatter, is up against Jordan's Prince Ali bin Al Hussein. Blatter refused to step down after the scandal was unearthed. Now, he faces a tough task to hold on to his position. Despite the troubles brewing in FIFA with a recent corruption scandal, soccer's world governing body is all set to vote for a new president. The 209 members will be voting in a secret ballot to choose from Sepp Blatter or Jordanian Prince Ali bin Al Hussein. FIFA president Sepp Blatter is a favourite to be elected for a fifth term. But his defiance to step down after the scandal has irked many members, including the United States and UEFA. Blatter maintained he is not responsible for the scandal and is determined to combat corruption in the sport. He cannot allow the reputation of football and FIFA to be dragged through the mud any longer. It has to stop here and now. 
And I know what is this strategy. Strategy is uh, to bring all the congresses, to have some uh, speakers in the room, to convince the people you know, as usual, to convince the most uh, to vote for him, and then at the end he will say, look at the democracy, democracy of the, of the most number, they will say that I have to stay, and I will stay. But uh, I think he already lost, FIFA was already lost. Even the United Nations is keeping an eye on the developments. FIFA has a tie-up with the UN, which now faces an uncertain future. We're watching uh, what's going on in, in Zurich and other places uh, very carefully. Uh, the UN has had a, a number of, of different kind of um, uh, one-time partnerships with FIFA through World Cups and other, uh, and other events with the UN, uh, UN agency, various UN agencies. The vote comes two days after top FIFA officials were held in Zurich on corruption charges. For an outright win, Blatter or Ali must secure 140 votes, a two-thirds majority. If the vote goes to the second round, then it will be decided through a simple majority. The result of the vote is expected to be announced by tonight. Bureau Report, Raj Sabha TV. And to help us understand uh, the governing politics of world football, we are joined by V. Krishnaswamy, Senior Sports Journalist. Thank you very much for coming in, Mr. Krishnaswamy. Just to quickly understand uh, how important is this election in terms of world football and uh, given the fact that there's been such a corruption scandal that has just emerged a couple of days ago, how does that impact this election and how critical does this become for football as a whole? You know, I mean, football's been a bit of a crisis, you know, over the last seven or eight years, especially, you know, ever since the last two, you know, ever since the awarding of the uh, next two World Cups, you know, in uh, 2018 and 2022, mm -hmm. um, uh, going to Russia and to Qatar. A whole lot of nations from Europe in particular have been protesting that the voting for the selection of the next two venues, uh, the next two host countries, was not exactly done in a very transparent manner, right. and that there was a lot of money which was uh, changed hands. And Plato's entire tenure, which started way back in 1998, has been clouded in a series of controversies. And very curiously and very interestingly, now one of his former um, opponents actually had pulled out of an election um, when FIFA accused him of bribery charges and he was actually thrown out and, um, and um, Blatto won it uh, unopposed. Mm -hmm. I think his clout basically comes from Africa and Asia and I think it, it, it's quite possible that he may continue uh, if the elections go through tonight. All right, so you think that the set bladder seems set given the kind of support uh, he has already, especially from large blocks like Asia and Africa who would be voting for him, as uh, news also suggests. But uh, in terms of the crisis that uh, world football is going through, the fact that corruption at such a high level has come out, and it certainly does, Maya. I mean, uh, the World Cups are the biggest sporting events across the world that happen once every four years. So certainly mired in controversy. Qatar, we've already heard of a lot of issues as far as how they didn't drive World Cup infrastructure is being developed as well. You know, what happens is the amount of money involved and the number of people involved, it is quite easily the most global of all sports, you know. Mm. When you look at any single discipline, nothing is bigger than football. Mm. It's something which is almost like the, the lowest common denominator when it comes to sport. I mean, just about everybody can play. All that you require is one ball and an open field and nothing else. Right. It requires a lot of basic human skills and from there it happens. And there's so much of money in football across the globe. Even in a country like India, which is somewhere around, say, 140th in the world, if you look at the stadiums, I mean, they are quite full when there is a match even, say, between not uh, world-class teams. It is, it's a sport which actually touches a core in every single, you know, what I call human being. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where the, the, uh, uh, the growth of the game has happened. And over the past 15, 20 years, or maybe actually a quarter of a century, uh, because of the uh, television rights and huge amounts of sponsorships running into billions, mm -hmm. the sport has actually become so big that it has actually quite almost, I mean, naturally has spawned a lot of corruption. And the last 15, 20 years, uh, we've seen quite a lot of that come about. And that has happened precisely during the period in which Blatter has been at the helm. All right, so Seb Blatter is being held uh, responsible, especially by his opponents as far as the UEFA and the US are concerned. But uh, yeah, moving on from here, do you think, despite the results of this election, uh, do you think this controversy is not going to die down anytime soon, given the fact that this kind of an investigation is already underway as far as the corruption charges are concerned? Well, certainly, I mean, uh, it's not going to go away in a hurry. You know, because also the news has come that the, the Swiss authorities have decided uh, to kind of an open an inquiry 
into the awarding of the, the two World Cups in 2018 and 2022. Hmm. And now with the Swiss authorities actually taking a very proactive role, and the United States, you know, because a lot of money is being rooted through banks in, um, in America, they've also come into the picture. I think it's not going to go away in a hurry. The, the, the 53 uh, European nations, I mean, a majority of them, almost 90% of them, have actually been anti-Blatter. Hmm. Blatter's, um, the, you know, kind of um, uh, strength comes in from Africa and Asia, because he brought Asia's first World Cup in 2002, hmm. when it was jointly hosted by Japan and um, the, South the South Korea. South. Hmm. And then in uh, 2010, when the World Cup came, for the, to Africa for the first time, hmm. and now when it comes to Qatar, I think he is actually banked on taking the sport to more Asian and African countries. Hmm. Why? That's a very laudable thing. But the fact is, the way it has been done, and what has gone behind the scenes, hmm. an amount of money, and if, you know, I mean, if, if reports are to be believed, even in a, in a very small manner, it's not just millions of dollars, it's probably running into billions of dollars, right. and over a period uh, which has been like more than a decade and a half. Hmm. So I think it's, this, is, this is a controversy which is not going to die down in a hurry. And, you know, we still have 2018, 2022 coming up. Right. It is a fear. UEFA has actually threatened to all the, the European nations have mm. actually threatened to pull out of the next World Cup. And that could be completely disastrous. All right. So, indeed, world football uh, at uh, tipping point of sorts. Thank you very much, V. Krishnaswamy, for coming in and helping us understand the politics of football a little better. Well, moving on now, we'll talk about actual sporting action and sports speed. <laughs> The Indian Challenge entered the, uh, the Australian Open Super Series after defending champion Saina Nehwal crashed out of the quarterfinals. The world number one lost to Wang Xian of uh, China 21-15, 21-13. China found it extremely difficult to play Wang, uh, to match Wang's play and looked fatigued before losing the encounter in just 42 minutes. Kochi has been provisionally selected as the venue for the under-17 FIFA World Cup 2017. The announcement was made by the tournament director, Javier Seppi, in Kochi today. However, Kochi may miss out if the stadium is not found satisfactory after inspection by FIFA officials in January and September next year. The tournament will take place in October-November 2017. The other venues are Delhi, Mumbai, Kolkata and Goa. Leander Pace and his Canadian partner Daniel Nestor breezed into the third round of the men's doubles event at the French Open. The 10th seed recorded, recorded a straight set victory, 7-6-6-2 over the German-Austrian pair of Andre Begemann and Julian Knowles. Tanya Mirza and her Swiss partner Martina Hingis also moved into the third round of the women's doubles. The world number one pair defeated their French Open in 6-3-6-4. In the men's single, 17 times Grand Slam champion Roger Federer recorded another straight sets victory to advance to the last 16 of the tournament. The world number two defeated his first opponent, Damir Zumur, 6-4-6-3-6-2. In women's singles, former champion Anna Ivanovic breezed into the French Open fourth round with a 6-0-6-3 victory over Croatia's Donna Vekic. Time for a quick break right now. Coming up on the other side, all the international media. In the face of international pressure, Malaysia denies responsibility for the Asian migrant crisis. Sarkash, today is our special guest, Mukh Chinawayut Sahib, Dr. Krishna Sinjali. आपकी पहली प्राथमिकता है क्या है? ऐसा इलेक्ट्रोल रोल देने की है जो एरर फ्री हो और मल्टीपल एंट्री फ्री हो। हिंदुस्तान में कोई भी शख्स कहीं भी चलते हुए अपने मोबाइल से वो डाल सकेगा? इसको अभी और फुल प्रूफ बनाने की जरूरत है। राजनीतिक दलों ने उसको हथियार के तौर पर इस्तेमाल किया है कि 20,000 से क लगभग 80 परसेंट जो पैसा है पॉलिटिकल पार्टीज के बाद वो 20,000 से कम वाला है। देखिए तरकश शनिवार रात साढ़े आठ बजे और रविवार दोपहर डेढ़ बजे। Welcome back. You're watching the news tonight. Now some international news. Myanmar today refuted allegations that they are the only ones to be blamed for the looming Asian migrant crisis. The statement comes amid both UN and US putting pressure on Myanmar for the crisis at a conference of the ASEAN in Bangkok. Many of the stranded migrants belong to the Rohingya community in Myanmar. Myanmar was singled out at the ASEAN summit in Thai capital Bangkok as Asian nations met to dissolve the migrant crisis. 
According to UN estimates, over a lakh Rohingya Muslims have fled Myanmar in the past three years, fearing persecution, escalating the crisis. Issue of illegal migration of both people, you cannot single out my country. Some issues fall within the domestic jurisdiction. We need to go and look at the root causes of, of why people feel they have no alternative but to flee their own countries and take such a dangerous, dangerous um, trip. Demanding for a swift action, Malaysia, Indonesia and Thailand extended all cooperation. Bangladesh also outlined ways they had already sought to tackle the issue. Thailand has allowed U.S. surveillance planes across its border to assist in the search for migrant boats drifting at the sea. First, to address the immediate humanitarian situation of stranded migrants. Second, to combat the long-term problem of people smuggling and human trafficking to prevent further irregular movements. Malaysia is also exploring the possibility to call for a summit meeting of leaders of the four countries concerned, namely Malaysia, Indonesia, Myanmar and Thailand, within the next few weeks. Representatives from 17 countries participated in the ASEAN summit in Bangkok along with the United States, Switzerland and UN Refugee Agency. Most of these countries are affected by irregular migration in the Indian Ocean. The crisis erupted this month as Thailand began crackdown on trafficking camps along its border with Malaysia. This prompted the traffickers to abandon thousands of migrants in crowded boats at sea. The UN report suggests that nearly 2,600 migrants are still stranded out there. Bureau report, Rajya Sabha TV. Time now for all the other news and updates from around the world in Global Park. Rebels seem to be taking advantage of the ceasefire in Ukraine as the Russian army is amassing troops and weapons near the border. Movement of heavy artillery, including mobile rocket launchers, tanks and artillery have been noted. The rebels look to be preparing for a new offensive, but Russia continues to deny any involvement in the conflict. On the second day of his whirlwind European tour, British Prime Minister David Cameron held talks with his Polish counterpart. Poland took a firm stand over the situation of Polish immigrants in Britain and rejected changing EU treaties. Cameron is trying to drum up support for EU reform. He has promised to secure a settlement before the referendum by the end of 2017. Car bombs killed at least 10 people in the Iraqi capital, Baghdad. The explosion took place outside two five-star hotels, one of them the most fortified areas in Baghdad. 30 people were wounded in the blast. The first of the two blasts targeted government officials holding meetings at the hotel. A remote volcano erupted today in, southern, in a southern Japanese island, blasting plumes of black smoke. The volcano erupted around 10 a.m., forcing authorities to order evacuation and diverting flights. The Japanese Prime Minister showed all help to ensure the safety of residents. However, a 72-year-old man suffered burns to his face after being caught in the pyroclastic flow. Well, that's the news tonight. Good night.